Well, we'll get underway. I, I see there's still a few folks coming in the parking lot here. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. Really appreciate the turnout. Wasn't sure what to expect when we did this here, and uh, it's, it looks like it's, it's going to be a big success. And uh, we want to start with, uh, uh, with Pastor Russ. Uh, I want to thank him for the hospitality of let, letting us use his facility here. This is program. This is hosted by the Second Amendment Patriots. Many of you are members of that group, and uh, uh, so we uh, just grateful that uh, it's turned out like it has. And I don't want to forget, we have some donation jars back there. There's two of them. One is stock, and so uh, and we appreciate it if you were able to uh, donate or contribute a little bit for the. Uh, for them traveling this far and for uh, the church being so grateful to let us have their facility. Right now, I'd like to ask um, Pastor Russ to come up and lead us in prayer. Well, thank you for coming tonight. And we do have some more folks who are coming in, so just come on and make yourself at home this evening. I was asked to say a word about something we're doing. We're doing a big community outreach this Sunday. And I can't have you all here without doing a little bit of a plug. But uh, we're going to have a big Carnival Sunday and things like that. Some of these are in the back. And uh, if you don't pick one up, Tom Cahoon will find you and hunt you down and give you one before you leave tonight. And so thank you for being here. We're going to pray and ask the Lord to bless the assembly tonight. Father, thank you so much for giving safety to those who traveled here this evening. We pray that everything that's done in this place here tonight would be to your honor and glory, Lord, that there would be uh, a peace that comes over us as we consider tonight that you are the Prince of Peace. And Lord, we need you. We need you more than we need anything else. And I pray that we would acknowledge that tonight. And then bless the speakers, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Russ, for that vacation. I think it's very fitting that we're having this gathering in the church. I'd like to just briefly tell you a little bit about how this has all come together. Uh, some of you had seen the YouTube with Dr. Stock when he was speaking to that school board. And that was very compelling, it was inspirational. And I wanted to try to reach out and get in touch with them, but I just didn't know how to do this. I was asking people, I even talked to our Senator Pro Tem, the State House, uh, about the chance if, if we could find out how we could get in touch with him to, to speak to our caucus about what he spoke about at that school board. And, but I wasn't getting too far with it. About two weeks ago, we were in Indianapolis for the whole week because it was a uh, finalization of the uh, districting, redistricting. And uh, Marge and I were staying at the West and across the street from the State House. And on Tuesday morning, I had an email to tell me there was a um, medical freedom rally that was going to take place at the State House on the South Lawn at 11 o'clock. And it just worked out where I was going to have to go over to the State House about that time. So I went over, and there was about a dozen people setting up microphones and tents and um, being at tables and everything like that to have this rally. So I, I said hi to a few of those folks and told them who I was and went on the inside. And later in the day, about 1 o'clock, I thought I had a break, so I wanted to go out and see if they were still there. And they were. It was a large crowd, a fairly large crowd of people. And um, uh, I said hi to some folks. And they wanted me to say a few words, which I did. And then I uh, thanked them for being there and told them, you know, some of the bills that I had going uh, concerning this issue. And then uh, the next morning, I had all these emails coming in, uh, thanking me for speaking because I was the only legislator, it turned out, that came out of the building to say hi to anybody. And so that was kind of nice. And, and one of the nice letters I got was from Dr. Stock, and I couldn't believe that. <laughs> How about that? So I wrote back and asked for a phone number, gave him mine, and we made a connection on the phone. This is the first time we've actually seen each other, it's just right here at the doorway. But uh, you gotta, you gotta acknowledge things that happen when God's involved in that. What's the odds, right? And uh, it's just divine, and I feel that way. And so, um, I, you know, the conversation I had, uh, we've only had a couple of conversations on the phone, but uh, Dr. Stock was so uh, cordial to accept an invitation to come down here, and so here we are. And it worked out that we have this nice, beautiful facility. I knew we couldn't have it in our Patriot meetings because there's no way we could house this many people. So this is all so well how it's, how it's developed. And um, 
I uh, just want to uh, point that out how things happen, and it's not coincidence, folks. I, you know, used to think a lot of things were coincidence. I don't think so anymore. Marge is giving me hand signals back there. What is it? <laughs> Team voice, guys. <laughs> okay, you go out here to the street. <laughs> they're at they're the home. Go down first right, and you'll see them. That's where they're at. Okay, so that's uh, that's good. Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, I, I would like to uh, point out some of the things that uh, about Dr. Stock, and uh, I can tell you that he's just a down-home person, because what he wrote to me uh, is just down-home. Um, I think it's, and he, I, I know he didn't give me all of his credentials here, but uh, I do want to uh, read to you what, what he did share with me. Um, he graduated from IU School of Medicine. He did his inter in, uh, internship at St. Vincent's Hospital and has practiced 32 years of family and five years of functional medicine since then. He was a founding diplomate of the American Board of Clinical uh, Lipid, Lipid, Lipidology. Is that right? Am I saying it right? Lipidology? How about that? Mark that down. <laughs> and is board certified in functional medicine by the American Board of Anti Aging and Regenerative Medicine. He is a direct pay family and functional medicine provider in Fishers, Indiana, taking no payments from insurers, government programs, or employers so that he can work directly for his patients and serve no one but them. And he is in no way. <laughs> and he's in no way associated with Dr. Fauci. <laughs> this time I would like to invite uh, Dr. Dan Stock to come up here and give him a round of applause. Failure for years, and you got influenza and died because it exacerbated your kidney failure. 
you did not get to be an influenza death. And that way we could actually, by identifying all of the diseases under the same criteria, we could make sure that we were accurately allocating all of our resources to the right way so we could get the relative risk of all of these diseases. So in March of 2020, uh, the Center for Disease Control changed the diagnostic criteria regulations for one and only one disease. And that was COVID-19. And by the way, I'm going to mention here that by doing so, they violated federal law. Because to change a federal regulation requires a 60-day comment period. So the guys like me and Jay Bhattacharya can call up and say things, are you smoking dope? There's no way we're going to know how severe this is relative to every other disease. We'll get things either out of control or we'll underestimate the disease and we'll get things wrong. But they said, no, even though the law requires us to have a 60-day comment period, we're just going to blow through that. They're now, by the way, being sued for the fact that they violated that law. So how did they change it? They said, well, to be a COVID-19 case, you have to have symptoms or a test. You don't need both. And by the way, that test doesn't need to be validated. Many people don't know this, but these PCR tests that they're using, which we have never used in any disease process like this before, are operating under experimental use authorization. <laughs> They've never been validated or proven. Nobody even knew whether they were going to get lots of false positive or false negatives before they rolled them out. And besides the fact you only had to have one or the other, the only other thing they kept intact was you couldn't have a positive test for another pathogen. So if you had a positive influenza test, you couldn't be called a COVID-19 case. And then if you wanted to be a death from COVID-19, what you had to have was symptoms, or a positive test, and no pulse rate. <laughs> and if you had those three criteria, you were COVID-19 now. Which means, and guys, this is not an exaggeration, and this has not been documented once, or twice, or ten times. You could get killed in a car accident, have somebody swab your nose, have it come back positive, and you're COVID-19 now. That is seriously how your federal government has been counting those numbers. So when they tell you over 600,000 people have died from COVID-19, and they say this is so much worse than influenza, the answer is, well, how are you defining this thing as a death? Because there have been many cases of people who got hit on bicycles, and the first thing they did was swab their nose, get them in the hospital, because they could then call that a COVID-19 death. Now, why would they want to do that? Well, it, it turns out there's one other difference between how we diagnose COVID-19 and the other disease. And that is the CDC decided that we would actually pay hospitals to diagnose the disease. So one of the things you guys may not know about me is I was elected to the physician board of my local accountable care organization, Health Network. Uh, I'm not allowed to tell you which one, and I'll explain that to you in a second why I can't. But in that capacity, I got to see the finances of how everything works with government payment and insurance payment to a hospital network. And I can tell you, hospitals lose money on every Medicare and Medicaid patient that walks in the door, inpatient or outpatient, because the government doesn't pay its bills. The only way they can actually make the bills meet is by financially destituting the people who have private insurance, overbilling the devil out of them. And where they get the greatest profit is on elective surgery. So the other thing that the CDC did when it said, hey, we're going to change the diagnostic criteria for COVID-19, they said all you hospitals have to shut off all of your elective surgeries. Oh my goodness, that's probably going to cause you some financial strain. Here's how we'll make it up to you. We will pay you $13,000 for every person who gets admitted to your hospital meeting our criteria for COVID-19. And we'll give you $39,000 for every person that you can get a tube down their throat and get them on a ventilator. <laughs> Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you may have the impression that the people in my profession that we walk around with halos off the top of our head and wings sprouting out the back of our chest. Um, but I gotta tell you that money changes the way we think just like it changes the way you would think. There's a reason I don't take money from any of those other things, and I don't make money on anything I give people advice about, because that's a good way to make a man an idiot really fast. And I think by the time of this, you may agree with me that pretty much the idiots are running the hen house. 
So the reason I can't tell you the name of that accountable care organization health network I work for is because I have a contract with them that says I have to deny having a contract with them at all. How many people know what an accountable care organization is? Have you ever heard that term before? Not very many hands. I thought not. So 15 years ago, your federal government said, hey, you know what would be a great idea to improve the efficiency of health care? We've got all these independent providers off doing whatever they think is right for their patients. And if we got them all employed by one great big organization so they can share information, that means we'll have greater efficiency of health care. And the way they financially enforce that is by saying all of you independent providers are getting a 3% cut in your reimbursement. So if you make $50 for a 20-minute visit right now, we're going to cut that by 3%. And if you all get together and join into an accountable care organization, or ACO, we'll give you a 2% increase in reimbursement. Now, the margins in medicine are actually very narrow, all right? Most hospitals are running on a break-even, all right? They, you know, the, the hospital I was working for, they were headed towards losing money at the time this, uh, that I left that health network. So all of these doctors said, well, I can't financially survive unless I join the ACO. So they all got employed by the ACO. But the ACO has some interesting clauses in those contracts. One of them is that if they ever fire that doctor, he has to move 10, sometimes 50, sometimes 100 miles away to practice for sometimes as long as one or two years. He's not allowed to take any of his charts with him. He's not allowed to tell his patients where he's going. He's not allowed to advertise for business in the area that he used to practice in. Some of these health networks say, you have to move 50 miles away from every single one of our offices, meaning you move out of state. Now you need to know that I'm a businessman, and what's my business capital? Well, it's the faith that my patients have in their access to get to me, and the advice that I'm gonna give them. And they basically own the access to the doctor. Um, as a matter of fact, when my ACO fired me, because I didn't play ball very well, they wouldn't even let me volunteer my services in the area, but near my hospital. Um, so understand this now, you have a guy who's got a contract with the hospital that is probably going to go bankrupt unless it gets a lot of COVID-19 money in the door. And he's got to feed his family. He has enormous loans. And by the way, a doctor comes out of medical school now, $350,000 in debt. And he can get that forgiven if he goes and works 10 years for an ACO. But if he works nine years, 11 months, and 29 days, and gets fired, he gets all $350,000 of debt back. Yeah, that's right, he's an indentured servant. So when the hospital says, hey look, you know, we're gonna go bankrupt here because we don't have any hip replacements coming in the door that we can make money on, I can tell you very quickly, things go out to give the doctors some directives, and they do what they want, what they're told to do, because if they don't, they're bankrupt. So here's the kind of directives that come up. Anybody walks in this hospital, they don't get an influenza test until we have the COVID-19 test back, because that influenza test can cost us 13 grand. All right? Second of all, if there's a borderline of whether this guy is going to go on the ventilator or not, you're sticking a tube down his throat, because that's 26 grand at stake if you don't do it. Everybody who comes in here for any kind of trauma, so that we don't spread the dreaded disease, we're going to swab his nose and see if we can get a COVID-19 test. And if it's positive, maybe we need him to come out for an overnight stay. All right? Because that just made 13 grand. Um, similarly, if the protocols say we're going to treat this way, that everybody who meets this thing is going to go on a ventilator, they're going on a ventilator. That guy gets into an auto accident, gets himself killed. The first thing you're going to do is get a swab up his nose. Because if we can get it back, COVID-19 death, we get paid for COVID-19 death. And so if you ask me, hey, are the data that's coming out of the CDC when they tell you about COVID-19, is that useful for comparing COVID-19 to any other disease? And ladies and gentlemen, I gotta tell you that data is so perverted that it is not behaving in all the way that we see it behaving in any other country that doesn't pay for diagnoses. Um, and I would like to tell you that those are rare cases of, hey, there was an administrator who went to a pulmonologist and told him, I don't care, get a tube down his throat and get him on the ventilator. But I can tell you, I've had those doctors call me since that video went out and tell me, Dan, thank you for speaking out. We would like to, but we're afraid, and I've had people tell me I had to do that. Um, so 
I can tell you we do have some data where we said, hey, let's try and get some cases, do selective samples, and see if we can see if we diagnose COVID-19 disease and death the same way we diagnosed it for influenza, pneumococcal pneumonia, and everything else, how would COVID-19 rate on that? And the answer is it's about as lethal as a moderate year of influenza, meaning that about 0.2% of people who develop symptoms and have a positive test with a useful cut point, so we can actually determine that test means they had that uh, particular disease, um, it's about 0.2% lethal, equal to an average year of influenza. Now, it hurts people differently. It's about 1 100th as dangerous to a young person, all right? About 1,000 times as dangerous to people over the age of 65 as influenza is. But because we have a lot more of those young people than we have people over the age of 65, the overall population risk is about 0.2%. Um, so how accurate is that test, that PCR test? So that PCR test is rated by what we call a cycle threshold, where we set that this, hey, if you get more than you know, this many cycle thresholds, we're going to call the test positive. So a little boring stuff on how tests are validated. Let me tell you about the greatest test that has ever occurred in medicine, and that is the serum beta HCG for pregnancy. And the reason we like that is you take a group of girls and you measure everybody's serum beta HCG, we find out that all the girls who end up with a pregnancy, a miscarriage, an abortion, or something like that have a level of five or greater, every single one of them, all right? Maybe we'll find one in here who doesn't. And all the girls who have, don't have any of those things happen in the next nine months, their levels are less than five. So that, that test separates with 99% certainty the people you need to do something about from the people you don't need to do something about. So those curves, if you were to plot out the levels of everybody in the population, how many people are there, you'll see a curve down here of all the girls who didn't have anything happen, another curve of all the people who did have something happen. There's almost no overlap between those two curves. If you do that same test within the PCR test, what you see is there is an enormous overlap in the curves. So the test would have its best diagnostic performance if you chose the cycle count that was right there where the two curves intersect. Now, it's still going to be lousy, all right? Because there's a lot of people who are testing positive on this curve. We don't have problems and all that. And you would have said, well, okay, if we're going to use this lousy test, we want to set the cycle counts from right there in the middle, which is about 23. Government says we're using 40. They've now taken it down to 33. At 33, the false positive rate is between 25 and 75 percent. Wow. That's right. If you go into a place where the disease is very prevalent, like a nursing home, one out of every four positive tests really doesn't have that virus anywhere in their respiratory system. If you go into a school, we're going to throw all the kids out of the place and ram them into masks and quarantine them if they have positive tests, three out of every four tests is somebody who does not have virus. And that is the diagnostic accuracy that your federal government came off with for this test and this disease. Okay, so that's how good we were at determining where we should allocate resources. By the way, somebody should ask a question, why, why would the CDC do that? Um, I've heard people say, well, we know it's an emergency. You know, in an emergency, having lousy tests doesn't make you do any better at uh, taking care of the problem. So you wouldn't want to have your classification screwed up for that. Um, you know, I, I tell a lot of people have data about conspiracy theories, and I tell them, you know, the best evidence for conspiracy theories is you can't explain them on the basis of biology, chemistry, physics, and anatomy. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm weak and I cannot come up with any explanation for why those laws were broken and why the rules of science were broken on the basis of an emergency. And since you can only get so stupid for free, that's when I start going looking for the other explanations. All right? And um, does anybody know what the Bayh-Dole Act of 1984 was? A little bit of government lecture. In 1984, your federal Congress made a change in patent law that made it so that if federal tax dollars were taken and given to somebody to do research that led to something that was patentable. Whoever was paid to do that research could own the patent for their personal profit. And in the Federal Register, there are over 1,000 patents that Dr. Fauci has gotten since he became, that's right, since he became the head of the NIAID, 
And by the way, he is not the only person at the NIH and the CDC who has patents on things that they got from our tax dollars. And that's in the Federal Register. I encourage you to go look it up. When this was first told to me, I went and looked it up. Some of those patents actually have to do with using PCR technology to diagnose coronavirus disease. All right? By the way, there are also patents on using the gene of the coronaviruses to make vaccines. So that's how good we did with diagnostic accuracy. Um, how about the recommendations we got for viral avoidance measures? Okay, how, how rational were those? So a couple of things you need to know about viral respiratory disease. 99 plus percent of the viruses that somebody who's infected are going to give off come off as very small particles that we call, we call aerosols. All right? Now there are different definitions of the size of aerosols. To me, this is a ridiculous thing to discuss. What you need to know is the aerosols for a coronavirus are about 0.5 microns or less. All right? N95 masks will take out anything 5 microns and bigger. So, most of the virus coming out will go through even an N95 mask. All right? If you look at a surgical mask, these things have gaps about right here and right here, right? Because your glasses always fog up when you're wearing them. So it turns out that if the total square surface area of gaps on the mask is three square centimeters greater, the filtering function drops to zero. And that's because there's so much more resistance to go through the filter than it is to come out of the gaps that the virus will just not come out through the mask at all. That is three square centimeters. And I can say the average person wearing a mask has got more than three square centimeters. And by the way, it doesn't just work when they exhale. When you inhale, the air doesn't come through here, it comes in through the gaps. Um, so, N95 masks, general population use, never had any basic science to support them at all. They will stop that, hey, you know I coughed or sneezed and sent thing out six feet, all right? Those are what we call droplet particles. I can tell you that all the virus coming out, less than 1% of the virus coming out of somebody is coming out through the coughs and the sneezes. The aerosols are actually shed just from regular breathing. You don't have to talk, you don't have to sing, just inhale and exhale, and you're putting out these aerosol particles. 99% of the virus is coming out that way. So if you're outside, this is no problem, all right? Everything just diffuses away, it gets rapidly diluted, nobody gets exposure to enough virus that they can come down. It's very hard to get one of these cases contracted outdoors, all right? And yet we got told that when you go outside, you should wear a mask. Um, does it make any difference indoor? Well, I can tell you what happens is you go indoors, viruses come out, they get concentrated in the air because the air is recirculated. We get a bunch of people in here, the virus level keeps going up um, until it finally gets the blood looking overcome anybody. But a mask doesn't change that. All right? Can't change that at all. Um, does this six foot social distancing matter if everything is going up to aerosol <laughs> particles? Because, like I tell you, these aerosols, they diffuse like oxygen or the bad smell you get when Dr. Fauci is talking. There's <laughs> the first of those jokes, I apologize. Um, mask has no effect on that, and never did. Nor did we ever have a reason to believe that it would. So the reason we don't do this in the common cold and influenza, which by the way are shed by particles about the same size as a coronavirus aerosol, is because as far back as 2008, we had done randomized trials where we actually went to a city and said, hey, we're going to pay you all to be divided up into two groups. You group are going to be just as cavalier with yourself as you can be, sneeze and cough on yourselves, your friends and your dogs and everybody else. You guys are going to mask up, you're going to quarantine when you're sick, wash your hands until you don't have any skin left, and we're going to fall out and see what this does to influenza. It had no effect on the rate of developing a positive test, symptoms, hospitalization, or death from influenza. So we already knew that none of this was going to work. And we had no reason to believe, at the time this came out in March, all right, that this was going to make any difference on this. And you know what, guys? It wouldn't matter even if it did. Because this virus has animal reservoirs. So the reason influenza keeps coming back every year is because ducks and waterfowl and other animals get infected with that virus, shed it back out, 
into the atmosphere. Some of these are domesticated animals that we hang around with. They get infected, they may not even have symptoms, but they shed it off into the place where the humans are at, the humans get it, start expressing it to each other. That's why we have influenza vaccines and we don't have influenza gone, right? So I can tell you we are now up over 20 different animals that have, we know could be infected with COVID-19 virus. At least five of them are domesticated animals that you can't get away from. We even know if you go out into the, into the woods and get a deer, that they're running like 20% of the deer are already positive for COVID-19. So ladies and gentlemen, I gotta tell you, any virus avoidance measure, eventually you're gonna get an immune system that takes care of this virus. We can talk about how you're gonna get it, but you're either gonna get an immune system that can do this, or you're gonna die. Or you're gonna get infected and survive. When we talk about you know, we're going to do all of this till we get to herd immunity. If all of the viral measure, avoidance measures worked, all they would do is delay the day that you got to herd immunity. That's right. And on the subject of herd immunity, you need to know that there are three different conditions that all contribute equally to herd immunity. One of them is that you can get a vaccine. One of them is that you can get infected and live. And the other one is that you can get infected and die. But either way, you contribute to herd immunity equally well. Well, there is some question about whether vaccination contributes to herd immunity, which we'll get into here in a second, whether it contributes equally well, all right? Um, so, okay, that's all basic science stuff. Do we have any higher stuff, epidemiologic studies and all this, look at masks and their ability to do this? And I want to stress when we talk about masks, we got to talk about mask mandates, right? Because everybody wants to wear a mask, right? Who care? It's your decision. <laughs> wear a mask, right? The question is, hey, should we make you wear a mask to protect him, right? So do we have any data on that? And the answer is, well, not that's been done right with proper statistical analysis. So I've seen a bunch of trials where we did randomized studies. We're going to make these guys wear masks and these guys not wear masks. <laughs> Most of those have had absolutely no benefit whatsoever to demonstrate. All right? Uh, there was one study that came out of Bangladesh where the population is much more dense. All right? Therefore, transmission is probably easier. And in this study, what we did was, and by the way, this was done a year and six months into COVID-19. Uh, we took a group of people and we said, okay, we're going to go to these cities and try and convince these people and educate them on masks. And we're going to let these cities just go on to their own and see what difference it has on this. And in the cities they went and intervened at, they were actually able to triple the rate of mask use from 17% to, I think they got up to 47%. At a 1% reduction, and the risk of developing a symptomatic case of COVID-19. All of that in people over age 50. Which means that all the masking you did for the young people and all that, no effect on anything. And by the way, that was not a mandate study, was it? These people all decided to wear the mask after they got educated. 1% benefit. How about when we actually did look at mandates? Because we do have some data from that. There was a study published by the CDC on this although they got corrected by the Heritage Foundation because they ignored half of the data. And when the Heritage Foundation put in the other data that the CDC ignored, it turned out there was no difference between the places that used mandates and that did not use mandates. There's a study published by Health Policy that claimed it showed a difference because they said, hey, we looked at the rate of positive test decline in the places that used mandates, and we compared that to the rate of decline in the places that didn't use mandates, and there was a statistically significant difference in the place that used mandates. There was a difference in the place that didn't use mandates, but it wasn't statistically significant. So that means that there was an effect. Well, guys, that's actually statistical bushwalk. Uh, they presented these two different graphs. But I can tell you that when you do the statistical analysis, just because this one statistically doesn't change and this one statistically does change, doesn't mean they're different from each other. And if you overlie those graphs and you see the error bars, they overlap at every point in time, which means had you presented the data, which we usually present all of that on one graph, so you can see those data bars overlapping. Um, if I had presented that as a sophomore biology student at Notre Dame and not done it that way, I would have probably had my paper handed back to me. But when you looked at that study, no statistical difference between the places that used mandates and the places that did not. And by the way, even if we had said, well, okay, we're going to give you that. How much effect was there? There was a 1% difference in positivity rates for a day and a half. And after a day and a half, no difference between them. And that was just a positive test. They still have not shown that the mask reduced the risk of having symptoms, reduced the risk of being hospitalized, 
reduce the risk of being dead. All right? Another study was just published a couple months ago. We looked at the Georgia school system. They said, see, the mass reduced the risk if we had a mandated place. Mandated schools had lower risk of positive tests, but only among the teachers, not among the students. Hmm. Do you know what? They also collected data, and some of those school systems were using ventilation, air purification, and quality improvement measures, like filtering the air to get rid of the virus or changing the air, opening windows, and things like that. That had a big effect, reduced everything. So those are what we call two separate dependable var dependent variables. And I'm a statistics geek, so I know that when you bring me a biological equation that has multiple dependent variables in them, I have to do a multivariate risk analysis inviting all of these variables in there, or I get statistical goo that means nothing. Is that what they did? No, they did their analysis on a single isolated variable, an independent analysis, even though it was a dependent variable. So what they were probably able to suggest was that school systems that ventilate their air are really scared of the virus and make their people do mandates. That's the best data I've seen on any of this. And that's not even the most important question that needs to be answered, is it? Because let's say even masks did reduce the risk of positive tests or symptomatic diseases or hospitalizations and death from COVID-19. You know, when I come out and do a chemotherapy drug, it's all great for me to make your tumor shrink, but if I make you die sooner, you don't want to take the drug, do you? So you have to show that the net harms are outweighed by the net benefits. So are there any harms of this masking? Well, actually, there's multiple harms. We already know that if I put this mask on you, that your carbon dioxide level in your blood is going to go up and your oxygen level is going to go down. And by the way, the smaller the child, the faster it comes on, and the greater the degree of oxygen drop and carbon dioxide increase. And there's an interesting thing that happens to human beings when you make those gases change in their blood. The part of your brain that's responsible for deciding whether or not you're suffocating <coughs> becomes activated. And that part of your brain that we call the amygdala hippocampus, excuse me, hippocampus complex, um, that thing is, entire, is in charge of making you go into fight or flight mode. And when it does that, it obligately reduces your ability to use memory. So if I had anybody here memorize everything I was wearing, and then I had you close your eyes and they said, hey, what color is my shirt? You would be able to tell me, well, Dan, that's white with some green and blue stripes. But if I then walked over to you with your eyes closed, and I put a gun in front of your face, and I said, open your eyes. And you open your eyes and say, what color are my shoes? The last thing that's going to come to your mind is, oh, those are navy blue. <laughs> because your brain is going to filter out every single memory that doesn't have anything to do with the angry man with the gun in your face. But then if I back up and say, close your eyes, now they can take a few deep breaths. Tell me what color my shoes. You'll be able to say, oh, they're navy blue. So this fight or flight system restricts memory. Now you put this on a child, all right, and you leave it on there all day long. Is there any possible way that it doesn't affect his ability to recall things and to put memory together? You won't be able to answer me the color of my belt if I walk up to you with a gun in your face and say, what color is my belt? Because your brain is not going to be looking to say, oh, that looks like that, sis. You're going to give that up. All right? So it retards learning. There's no way it can't retard learning. As a matter of fact, I got to read the deposition of a lawsuit that I'm involved with of a speech therapist who presented the data that showed that it retards learning. How many people here have children that they think can afford to learn a little bit less? <laughs> Let me tell you the other lie that was told. Well, they'll just learn it later. All right? I know that if I take a six-year-old, a six-month-old child, I put a patch over its right eye and leave it there for four months. It will never learn to use that eye again. I can take the patch off, it will have it will be the rest of its life. The idea that that child will recover all of the stuff that he was supposed to be learning through the complex interpretation of all those facial expression muscles that are hidden behind that mask. And by the way, more communication occurs through your facial expression muscles for you than any other species in the world. We have more facial expression muscles than any other animal, bar none. Um, and all of the stuff that your kid has to do to learn that is retarded by putting on that mask. And we're not even in to the discussion of what happens when we start looking at the social isolation things like, gee, you have to stay home and can't collect your paycheck, you can't go see your friends. As a matter of fact, in California, the state that locked down the most, the excess teen suicides was greater than the total number of all children of all ages who died from COVID-19. So the question you really want to ask is, is there a study that shows that the contact tracing, the uh, isolation, the 
quarantining, the masking mandates, was the net benefit to reduce the risk ever shown in any study that it had a net benefit? And the answer is there are zero studies. As a matter of fact, what the CDC has been fond of uh, putting out is a case study of a hair salon where some people got infected wearing masks and the other people didn't get infected. And that has been the argument your CDC has, has been presenting for why you should have these mask mandates and why we should bankrupt our hospitals despite having evidence from over 10 years ago that it was going to make absolutely no difference in the outcome. So all the bankruptcy, all of that occurred, didn't occur without us knowing beforehand this had no chance to make a difference. We knew it had animal reservoirs, we knew the mask couldn't filter it, we knew that it wouldn't matter if we did, you were going to have to face this virus sooner or later. So, that's how well your government did with its advice on all of its isolation information and virus avoidance measures. So we're all going to have to have an immune system that takes on this virus. Um, there are a couple basic facts that we need to go through about viral respiratory infections to begin with. Does anybody know what percentage of people who truly become infected with COVID-19 virus have no symptoms at all? They get infected, but never get any symptoms. It's 70%. <laughs> that, by the way, is the very same number for influenza and the common cold. Now, let me compare and contrast that to German measles. In medical school, I was taught that 95% of people who got German measles develop symptoms. What that tells me is 5% of humans have a good enough immune system that they can get infected with German measles and not have any symptoms. So in the calculation of disease, which is disease equals pathogen times immune system competence, the big variable in German measles is the pathogen, right? What's that tell you about COVID-19 influenza and the uh, common cold? The big variable is the immune system, isn't it? Because 70% of people have an immune system, they can get infected with COVID-19 virus and they don't even know they've got it. So, this may be a viral infection, but ladies and gentlemen, like influenza and the common cold, this is an immune system disease. All right? And I want to make sure everybody hears me say that because some fact checker is going to come out and say that Dan Stock said, COVID-19 is not a viral disease. Well, guys, it's a viral infection, but it's not a viral disease. It's an immune system disease. So, what kind of things can we do to help an immune system so it works better at this? Well, one thing you can do is vaccines. Ladies and gentlemen, you're probably going to be told that am I anti-vax? I'll make a statement here like I made it before. I'm glad my mom and dad gave me MNR vaccine. Wish the chicken pox vaccine had been available when I was a kid. I'd give my own kid in the bar chicken pox vaccine right now. Do some things before I gave it to him, but I'd give him those vaccines. All right? So I'm not anti all vaccines. But let me tell you how we actually validate vaccines as being safe and effective, all right? And why we had to do it that way. So back in the 1960s, the FDA did not require that drug companies did any animal trials before they did a placebo controlled randomized blinded trial of vaccines in humans. You can take your vaccine right to humans. So there's a disease called respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV. A company came up with a vaccine for this, took a group of kids, divided them in half. You guys are getting dummy shots, you guys are getting RSV vaccine shots. We're going to follow out and prove how good our vaccine is. It started off looking good. All right, if you looked at the rate of building RSV vaccine, it started off higher than the people who got placebo than the people who got the shot. But around nine months to a year, those curves crossed, and all of a sudden, the RSV infection rate of the vaccine took off through the roof. As a matter of fact, it ended up there were more kids who died from RSV in the vaccinated group than in placebo. Wow. What they died from was a condition called antibody-dependent enhancement. So there's a bunch of things that go on in ADE, but suffice it to say that we are able to make your immune system fight the virus wrong. So let's talk about how a virus, a viral respiratory infection actually gets fought by your immune system. So a virus cell gets infected, that infected cell starts to send off some things called inflammatory cytokines. And inflammatory cytokines do two things. They tell all the cells around the infected cell, hey, I'm in danger. I have virus infection. My particular pattern of cytokines will tell you I have a viral infection. 
so that you will make your cell membrane become very, very stiff and hard so things can't get in and out real fast and real easily. That will keep the virus from getting you. Now, you want to control that process because when that virus makes its cell membrane get real stiff, it doesn't do its job real well. If I took every cell in your lung and made it suddenly go into that thing we call cell danger response and get stiff, it wouldn't exchange gases very well and your lung wouldn't work too good. So you don't want every cell to do it, just the ones that are there. And the other thing those cytokines do is they call off to a group of white blood cells called lymphocytes and macrophages. And the signals are very specific. We don't need neutrophils, don't need eosinophils, don't need basophils. We just need those white blood cells and we need them in here real quick. We've got a problem. So that infected cell actually starts telling the immune system what to do. The first cell that comes in here is called a natural killer cell lymphocyte. He doesn't know anything about what kind of virus you've got. He just walks up to a cell and says, are you healthy or not? The cell says, no, I have a virus infection in. He says, okay, you get to commit apoptosis. He makes that cell do this process where he digests all of the genetic material inside, viral and its own genetic material. But before it does so, it puts a little signal on the cell membrane that says, hey, I just committed apoptosis because I had a virus infection. By the way, the lung cell already got a thing on its surface that says, I'm a lung cell. Now this thing called macrophage comes in and he comes up to that cell and he says, oh, I see the information. You've been told to go into apoptosis because you're a lung cell that's infected with some virus. Okay, now I know what to do. I go to what's called a T helper lymphocyte and that macrophage tells the T helper lymphocyte, these are proteins that I got from an apoptotic cell that had a viral infection that was found in the respiratory system. And now the T helper cell says, oh, well, then I should, with all of that information, become a Th1 cell and make something called cytotoxic T cells. And cytotoxic T cells go back into the respiratory tissue and they say, look, I look for only the proteins that I found that were shown to me by the macrophage from the virus. Oh, there's one, and I destroy that cell and I kill it, and I send a signal back to my T helper and says, I found one, make more cytotoxic T cells. And very rapidly, this tissue becomes filled with cytotoxic T cells. We're going and checking every cell in the tissue. You got a protein, bam, you're dead. You're good, okay, you can live. You're dead, bam, you're gone. And that is how a virus infection gets destroyed. And you never heard me say the word antibody one time, did I? Antibodies do not fight viral infections. All they do is flow to the bloodstream and prevent spread of viral infections. Now, this is a useful thing to have, all right? So let's say you're German measles. German measles very rapidly after it infects lung cells, gets out of the lung and starts spreading through the body to skin cells and other things like that. So when a signal like that comes through the immune system, all right, we've got a respiratory system that's infected, we've got all the signals going here, white blood cells go in there, and all of a sudden the T helper cells start to hear signals from other tissues. They say, ah, I'm going to have some of my T helper cells not become Th1 and make cytotoxic T cells, they're going to become Th2 and make a little bit of antibody. That'll stop the spread. That works great for gym and measles. Problem with it, you've got to quit making fewer cytotoxic T cells in order to make those B cells and make antibodies, all right? So if you've got a virus that doesn't spread very rapidly out of the respiratory system, it is not good for you to make antibodies. And that is why when you have something like influenza, the common cold, or COVID-19 virus that does not rapidly get out of the respiratory system and go through your bloodstream, that many people with properly functioning immune systems will make no antibodies at all in their first infection. All right? The only other time they'll make an antibody is if they get reinfected again with about nine months to a year. Then when they get reactivated, those T helper cells will say, eh, okay, this is becoming a problem, we'll make some antibodies just in case it becomes an issue. But many, many people who have been infected with COVID-19 have no antibodies to them, especially if their immune system worked right. The other reason you're doing that, though, is because antibodies aren't always good, all right? So you can have what's called a neutralizing antibody. It's actually something that binds to the pathogen and makes it so that it can't infect cells. But you can also what's called, what's called an enhancing antibody. And this is actually an antibody that takes that pathogen and changes its conformation on the surface or puts it someplace it wouldn't normally go so it can actually infect cells it would not normally be able to infect. And that's what happened with the RSV vaccine. They actually got this thing to make antibodies, and those antibodies bound to the RSV virus and made it so it could infect the very white blood cells that were supposed to fight the infection. And with more repeated exposures, more and more antibodies got made, less and less cytotoxic T cells got made, until these poor kids had an immune system that wasn't able to fight RSV virus as well as if they just got infected on their own. 
So after that debacle, the FDA said, okay, we've got to have some new rules for making vaccines. You don't get to do trials in humans and do, do trials in animals. You've got to have short-term trials in animals. So let's fast forward to 1976, when the federal government, the first time, told us it was going to save us from some nasty virus. And so they came out and told us we're all going to die from swine flu virus, did some animal trials on a vaccine, paid for the vaccine, brought out a vaccine, animal trials look good, let's we'll start giving them to humans. And then all of a sudden, humans started developing an autoimmune disease called Guillain-Barre syndrome, where white blood cells start attacking the, the insulation cells in your nervous system. And after 28 cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome, 28 more cases than we had seen with just swine flu infection on its own, they shut down the program. They said, wow, vaccines can cause autoimmune diseases too. Okay, now we've got new rules. Here's the way you get a vaccine so that you can say that it's safe and effective and approve it. You've got to take animal trials. You've got to do those for two to three years so we can make sure that ADE isn't going to develop. And if you haven't killed all the animals who got the vaccine, they're still doing good and showing some sign of benefit. And you can take small groups of humans and give them different doses of your vaccine. We're going to see what old organs that thing goes into. And we're going to follow those guys out for two to three years and see how their organs do. And if their organs do okay, we don't see anything bad happening. Then you can do a large trial, randomized, placebo-controlled, in human beings that are typical of the population we're going to aim the vaccine at. All right? And you have to carry them out for two to three years so we can make sure they're not going to get ADE and autoimmune diseases and other bad things. And then if all that pans out, and you've gone through this seven to 10 year process of getting this vaccine validated, we're gonna let you sell that to the general public. How many of those steps were followed for the COVID-19 vaccines? <laughs> That's right, none of them. Let me tell you something more frightening. None of those steps were followed despite the fact that your CDC paid for research to try and make four different types of vaccines against the SARS coronavirus and the MERS coronavirus. And those trials all ended with the rats developing different forms of antibody-dependent enhancement. In one trial, they actually got the immune system to make a wrong kind of antibody called IgE. That's the one that mediates allergies. By the way, when your immune system is developing an allergy, it thinks it's fighting a parasite. That's the IgE is used to fight parasites. So they actually managed to confuse these poor rats to think that their immune system should go with parasite attack on a viral infection. And now you had a swollen, inflamed, allergic lung that was also virus infected and being damaged and rats started getting sick. And despite that, they said, eh, we can go and skip all those safety steps. Let me make this even scarier for you. Let me tell you what's unique about that COVID-19 virus that's different than the SARS and MERS coronavirus. So those guys all bind to this thing called ACE2. So when I get a cell in flame, say because you eat lousy food, or you smoke, or you live in a biotoxic building, cells will start making this enzyme called ACE1, which is very pro-inflammatory. Causes clotting, causes scarring, causes tissue to swell, makes all kinds of white blood cells, even ones you don't need, come running into it. But whenever a cell launches ACE1, it also launches another protein called ACE2. And ACE2 undoes the inflammation of ACE1 to kind of modulate down that inflammatory load. It is that ACE2 enzyme that SARS, MERS, and COVID-19 to bind to. The difference is that the COVID-19 virus that they engineered, and by the way, ladies and gentlemen, there is no chance that's a naturally occurring virus. Amen. And I don't need to know that they were doing research in Wuhan, China to say that. I know enough about genetics that I'm confident there's no way this occurred naturally. But what they engineered this virus to do is it doesn't just bind to the H2 enzyme, it cleaves it and destroys it. Now think about that. That means if there are any inflamed cells in your body and this vaccine gets into them, they are suddenly going to become much more inflamed. Right? As a matter of fact, if you take that spike protein, that's the thing that binds for that H2, and you take a healthy human being and you just infuse spike protein into him, he will get fevers, chills, aches, and fatigues, all the symptoms of COVID-19. The spike protein by itself without any other parts of the virus is toxic. And yet, your FDA and CDC thought it would be a great idea to come out with a vaccine that makes cells produce a toxic protein. And let me make this even worse. They don't cause a virus infection in the cell. So now you have a very inflamed tissue making a toxic protein 
that doesn't have any virus-infected cells to give all the instruction to the immune system to tell it what it should be doing about all the inflammation it has walked into. And in the face of that, your CDC and FDA said, let's just go ahead and do these vaccines anyway and run them through. So what's the data we do have? All right, let's be good scientists and look at all the data. First thing you need to know about the studies that were done, because there were placebo-controlled randomized blind studies. Those are the ones that will give you 95% predictivity of what's going to happen. They were done. Remember how we said you had to get a population to study them that was typical of the population you were going to give the vaccine to? Well, they threw that to the side as well. To get into the COVID-19 trials, you could not have had a positive COVID-19 uh, test up your nose with PCR or serology. You couldn't have any antibodies to, to SARS-CoV-2 virus. You actually couldn't have ever had symptoms of COVID-19. Now remember, those are the same symptoms of influenza, all right, for most cases. Which means anybody who had a bad enough immune system, they could get influenza was thrown out of the trial. You weren't allowed to have any autoimmune diseases. And if you were pregnant, you weren't allowed in the trial, because pregnant women have an increased risk of autoimmune diseases, plus you might be able to injure some babies. So this population they studied was very, very healthy compared to the average population of the United States. Let me give you some numbers so you can understand that. Remember the death rate, if you calculate it the same way you calculate the death rate for influenza, is 0.2%. So let's look at Pfizer's trial. They had 23,000 people in their placebo group times 0.2%. Should have been four people died from COVID-19 in that study if they had selected a population that was the average health of the United States. Now, if you use the CDC's numbers, a 2% fatality rate, there should have been 40 dead people from COVID-19 infection in the placebo group. Do you know how many people died from COVID-19 in Pfizer's placebo group? It's a very round number. That's right. Zero. All right. Now, let's make sure we understand what that means from the get-go. The only way that study can prove that the vaccine reduced your risk of dying from COVID-19 is if we put some dead people in the vaccine group and they came back to life. So one of the things I want you to go home with is somebody asks you, is there any placebo control randomized blinded data that shows with 95% certainty that these vaccines prevent you from dying from COVID-19? The answer is no. There is not a single trial. Someone tells you these vaccines save life, you tell them, I want to see the study that proves that the placebo control randomized blinded trial with 95% certainty. And I can tell you they will have nothing to hand you. All right? Okay? What did these studies show? Well, let's make it get worse. Did they prevent symptoms? The answer is no, they cause symptoms. Why can I say that? If you looked at people who got the vaccine in Pfizer's trial versus people who got placebo, there was 164 fewer cases of symptomatic COVID-19 in the vaccine group. So 164 fewer cases of a painful, fatiguing, fever-causing disease. To achieve that in the vaccine group, they had to cause 19,000 cases of sore arms, 11,500 cases of fatigue, and 6,750 cases of fever. And in fact, if you looked at the overall number of symptoms generated compared to placebo, there were more symptoms caused by the vaccine than there were prevented. You did worse on symptoms if you were vaccinated than if you were not. So if somebody tells you these things prevent severe disease, well, that was, they, were, they were right about that. If you looked at severe COVID-19 disease, there were fewer cases in the vaccinated group. But if they said it prevented symptoms, no. Vaccine caused more symptoms than it prevented. The risk were against that. Okay, so we do have some data that says it prevents severe disease and hospitalization. It doesn't prevent overall symptoms. It doesn't prevent death. Do we have any data that says it reduced overall hospitalizations? You know, we do have that data now. Hot off the presses, published about 10 days ago, somebody said, you know what we ought to do is take those three studies, Moderna, Pfizer, and Johnson & Johnson, and combine them all together so we've got a big population we can study of both placebo and vaccinated people and see if on average this thing actually reduced the risk of hospitalization and severe morbidity, meaning I got so sick I had to miss work or miss my activities. All right? Now, I gotta tell you, this guy who's geek and likes statistics, there's a nice way you can jack around with studies, all right? If you pick your population right, and you get the size of the population right, you can show one thing with statistical significance, but 
This other thing doesn't quite have enough people in the population to show it's statistically significant. I can actually have more of those things occur, but it doesn't reach the threshold of 95% certainty. So now you do a big meta-analysis, you put all those three studies together, and since they all have very similar diagnostic criteria, you can probably say with 95% certainty whether the vaccination program is more likely to prevent overall hospitalization and overall severe morbidity or not. Does anybody know what the answer to that was in that study? No. You were more likely to be hospitalized if you got vaccinated than if you took placebo. You were more likely to miss work and have severe illness if you got vaccinated than if you took placebo. That means that overall, this thing may have reduced COVID-19 disease, but was causing enough other disease that with 95% certainty, we would tell you you were more likely to consume the resources of your community if you took a vaccine than if you took placebo. And we can say that with 95% certainty. Now, that's all short-term data. But I can tell you, after three months, they vaccinated the entire placebo group. Because it just wouldn't have been fair to not expose those people to the increased risk of hospitalization and symptoms. And that really was their argument. Well, we prevented those 164 cases. We, should, we can't deny these other people. So know as we start to talk about everything else to do with these vaccines, all right, we're going to have, I've got another bottle up here already. Yeah. They, I've been set up good, they understand. <laughs> so from here on out, we're going to talk about studies that are less than 95% predictive because the research on these vaccines has been so badly botched that we do not have it. And by the way, you would never be able to do a good study on these vaccines now because the population has become what we call biased. If you came out and said, okay, we're going to try and recruit a group of people to go into this vaccine trial, and some of you are going to get placebo and some of you are going to get the real stuff, guys like me are going to say, no, I know what happened the first time you tried that. I'm not going into the trial, which means you're going to selectively get only a group of people in the population who trust the government. All right? <laughs> so what data do we have long-term and short-term on the effect of these vaccines? So um, I can tell you, and let's go into this idea of shedding because you what you've all been told is you know you're just a very selfish human being because you won't get vaccinated and you're going to let him die you're not going to get your vaccine you're going to shed virus and he's going to die because you didn't take your vaccine that, that's what has anybody not heard that is that not what you've all been told yeah. that's why you all get vaccinated anybody else right so you know how many studies on how many different pathogens have ever had that proven that if we took a group of willing people and vaccinated them and then took a group of unwilling people and divided them in half and forced half to get vaccinated and then half not to get vaccinated and were able to show that we protected the people who chose vaccination. Do you have any of those studies that have been done? Not a single one. What you've been told is, oh, we were able to wipe out smallpox with vaccines. Smallpox had no animal rushing lives. It was a dumb virus, the only thing it ever learned to infect was humans. All right, it had a very short incubation period, so it was very quick to find the people who had it. Quarantine made a difference in that virus. Influenza vaccine has been away around a long time. You got any data that says vaccination protects the willing if you vaccinate the unwilling? Not a single study. All right? You don't have that for measles, mumps, rubella, chicken pox, diphtheria, pertussis. You haven't done that for any of these vaccines. All right? Well, let's look at the surrogate marker of what's called viral load. That means, hey, how much cootie do we find up your nose when we go test you or when you get symptoms? So do we have any data on that? We do have data on that. Of course, it's not 95% certain data because we don't have it against placebo. But we do have it so we can compare it to people who chose not to get vaccinated. And I can tell you the data comes back very quickly in the United States. The people who got vaccinated shed just as much virus as people who didn't get vaccinated. Mm -hmm. right? And that was true whether they had symptoms or not. right? Because you can be vaccinated and you still get infected. By the way, I've heard this out there on the fact checkers. Dan said vaccines don't prevent you from getting infection. Guys, i got to tell you, this thing is not some force field that comes up around you as soon as the needle goes into your deltoid muscle. That virus, these pathogens still go into your body, all right? They get into your lungs, they still infect cells. The idea of a vaccine, like an MMR vaccine, is to make your immune system so good that it can fight this thing off before you get symptoms, all right? But you still get infected. You still shed virus after you're vaccinated, even with MMR vaccine. Yeah, an outbreak of measles, mumps, and rubella occurred in the National Hockey League about seven years ago. All of it broke out on the people who were unvaccinated or had no vaccine status. 
but half of those people never had contact with another person who was unvaccinated. Where'd they get the where where they get the measles or the mumps from? The vaccinated people, right? Okay. So other viral load data we have? Yeah. Here came Delta variant. Alright? So let me start off by telling you with Delta variant, we have what's called a molecular modeling study. We can actually take the antibodies from somebody who's been vaccinated and say, hey, if we mix that with this particular pathogen, it starts changing conformation. Does it actually make it easier to infect white blood cells? And that study came back and said Delta variant is actually much more enhanceable than the earlier variants of COVID-19. Now remember, there's a reason your immune system tries not to make antibodies if it doesn't need them. Because it may make some antibodies that are actually enhancing. It's in the RSV virus did it in the ferrets that came through the other, COVID, the other coronavirus vaccines. So now we have data that says, yeah, you're actually making antibodies that can breed and select for a particular variant of this who is able to abuse only the people who are vaccinated. Now remember, these vaccinated people also don't make as many of those cytotoxic T cells. As a matter of fact, I'll give you some numbers that hopefully will be a little entertaining to you. Um, we actually have a study that shows if you take one of these vaccines for COVID-19 after your second shot, the total number of your cytotoxic T cells and natural killer cells will be less than it was before you took your vaccine. We are going to reduce your ability to make the very things that fight the virus at the tissue where it comes in. And Dr. Fauci and them are all crowing about the fact that their antibody levels were higher than people who just got naturally infected. As a matter of fact, I have a patient who's coerced into a vaccine her antibody levels are 100 times the levels of people who recovered from COVID-19 naturally. Does this sound like your immune system is working really well to you? So now in this setting, you have a group of people who can walk around and can't find, fight the infection at the site where it comes in, and they make lots of antibodies, which makes them, they're able to infect more, so they shed longer, all right? And lo and behold, we have a spike in Israel starting about the beginning of June, outbreak of Delta variant. Why does Israel matter? It matters for two reasons. Like Great Britain, Israel is actually keeping the data the right way. All right? You are vaccinated, partially vaccinated, or unvaccinated. All right? You're unvaccinated if you've never had a shot. If you've had one shot, we call you partially vaccinated, and we're even breaking it down to you're partially vaccinated within the first three weeks after you took that shot or partially vaccinated, you took more and never got another shot even three weeks after that, maybe because you had such a bad reaction the first one, you wouldn't take a second one. And then we got vaccinated, we call vaccinated from the day the second shot goes into your arm, all right? And well, all of those classifications are being done by, have you recovered from COVID-19 before you got your vaccine, or were you naive before you got your vaccine? So they're taking the data the right way, and they aren't paying their healthcare systems to collect it the way they want them either. And the other reason Israel is useful is because Israel is the most highly vaccinated country in the world that got vaccinated faster than every country in the world. And lo and behold, starting about June, they had an outbreak of COVID-19 that was initially coming out in the unvaccinated. You've all heard this. This is an epidemic of the unvaccinated, right? You know what happened in the RSV trial? It turned out that the people who started getting sick first from the RSV were the unvaccinated. All right? The unrecovered, people who are naive to RSV, these kids got exposed to it. They came down, the unvaccinated came down sick first. Why? Because they had absolutely no antibody protection and were being shed a lot more virus from the vaccinated kids they were around. As a matter of fact, there was a disease done in chickens where they tried to vaccinate the chickens for Merrick's disease with the vaccine. The exact same thing happened. In the coops where they had these vaccinated things, a whole bunch of the unvaccinated chickens started coming down sick. And then after that, all the vaccinated chickens started getting sick, and they got sicker than the unvaccinated chickens. And I can tell you, in Israel, it started off there talking about, well, only 25% of the people in our ICUs are, are, are vaccinated. And then it went up to 50, and then it went up to 70. And when it finally topped off, 85% of the people in the ICU uh, in Israel were fully vaccinated. They actually were able to calculate the protection the vaccine was giving people uh, for hospitalization, it was 17%. And by the way, your threshold to get your vaccine approved in the United States was 50%. Let me make that worse, because one of the things you guys have been told, and the way this has been phrased, is that COVID-19 is a, it's a case of vaccination or nothing. But there's another option, isn't there? There's natural immunity. And 
we could repair those problems in that 30% who had bad immune systems, and then they would get exposed to the virus, and their immune, their immune system would react right, and they would get natural immunity. So we really need to compare is natural immunity as good, better, or worse than vaccine immunity. So again, we don't have 95% certain studies, but we do have data from Israel. They looked at that, and they actually compared people tracking with their very good tracking system to see, hey, what was the relative immunity benefit of vaccination versus natural infection? And the answer was that if you were vaccinated in Israel, you had 13 times the risk of having a positive test. You had 27 times the risk of having symptoms. You had 7.6 times the risk of getting in the hospital. And that was compared to somebody who recovered from COVID-19 just within the last seven months. So they said, well, okay, let's see if we compare people who could recover a year and a half ago. Maybe they've lost their immunity. No, you still had six times better immunity than somebody who took the vaccine, even if you recovered up to a year and a half before. So, if there's a way to make somebody's immune system get better, so it can get infected with the virus and not die in natural immunity, that's looking a lot better than what you can get with a vaccine. Why about boosters? We'll just fix that problem with a booster, right? Let me tell you what we know about boosters. Israel kept some good data because they started doing boosters. And we have data on that viral load shedding, and it turned out when you first got a vaccine, for the first two months, you shed less virus than somebody who just got infected naturally. After two months, two-thirds of that benefit was lost. By six months, all of it was gone. And that was in the general Israeli population. If you looked at people over the age of 50, where most of the transmission occurs, most of the disease, most of the death occurs, where you most want to shut down the shedding of virus, they had a reduction. It was only about half as good as the general population. And it only lasted two months, and after two months, it was completely gone. If you got infected with COVID-19 after vaccination, two months after your vaccination, you shed virus just like somebody who had no immunity to it whatsoever. And they said, well, let's look at what happens when we give people boosters. Now, before I tell you how this booster thing works, let me tell you what happens when I give somebody a MR vaccine. I give the kid the first shot at age one, he's good until age five. He gets a good immune response. If I give him another day of five, he's good for the rest of his life. That second response to the booster vaccine is even better than the first time I gave him that thing. That sounds like a good working immune system and a great vaccine. So what happened with boosters in Israel? You take people and give them boosters? Is that viral load shedding? shedding get reduced? Well, yes, but only half the blood in your primary two. By the way, if you're over the age of 50, it only gets reduced one third as much as your primary series. We didn't even follow those people out long enough to see how long they would get that diminished response. But does this sound like the vaccine is making your immune system work in a good way? When the second shot actually getting you no more? Let me make that worse. Pfizer had already submitted the data to the FDA for its booster program. They took a group of people who had already been vaccinated, and Pfizer thought, you guys get a placebo, you guys are getting a booster shot. The study's not been published yet, but the Vaccine Advisory Committee that reviewed the data has come out and leaked what they said, and they said, you know what, there were more dead people in the, in the booster group than there were in the placebo. And there were four, maybe four times as many heart attacks and strokes. By the way, you want to talk about H2, H1 enzyme? You know what tissue in your body expresses probably the most amount of those? A cholesterol blockage in your arteries. And you know what makes you have a heart attack? Is when that thing gets so inflamed one day it cracks open, and then because it's so inflamed that it clots so easily, it clots off the entire artery, and that's what a heart attack is. What do you think would happen if I made that cholesterol blockage cell start expressing a whole bunch of spike protein? Yeah, and wow is right. Um, so it explains what we saw with the boosters, all right? Um, anybody come out and tell me that boosters have a good dot com slash COVID dash 19 dash info. That's my uh, private practices website. I have a whole page on there. I update it regularly, putting new studies on there. That's purehealthmed.com. And you'll see a tab on there for COVID 19 info. If you want to go right to it, it's code purehealthmed.com backslash COVID dash 19 dash info. All the studies are on that I update it regularly as I get more out. Because, like I said, I'm a pasty geek and I read this stuff for fun. Yes, ma'am. Question is, 
how did the accountable care organizations, how did, those, how did that get forced, that financial regulation? It's established by regulation, meaning that what basically the federal Congress did was go to the executive branch and say, hey, we want you to make a whole bunch of stuff off of Medicare and Medicaid and make it work right. And they gave the executive branch power to rule by fiat and come out and make regulations that said that. And so there was a bunch of supposedly expert doctors. I assume they in here. I got to tell you guys, this isn't making me want to take a booster if I ever have my primary series. But that's what we know about the benefits so far. Uh, it doesn't reduce your risk of death short term. It appears to increase your risk of symptoms and hospitalization. What are those long term for benefits and risk? Benefits? Looks like things are pretty much all gone by six months. Maybe it's reducing your risk of severe infection, but I got to tell you, the data from Israel says nope, even that's gone by the end of six months after your vaccination. All right? Boosters? Well, it'll get you a little bit back for how long? We don't know, but whether it's a net benefit? Doesn't look like it. How about just the, the risks of the primary shot series? Again, we don't have 95% certain data. All we have is the vaccine adverse events reporting system. Does anybody know what VAERS is? Anybody not know what VAERS is? Okay, for those who don't know, 32 years ago, the government set up this thing called the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, which is what we call a voluntary reporting system. Anybody who gets a vaccine can call up and say, hey, this is my name, my age, here's the lot number and all this I had for my vaccine, and here's all the things that went wrong with me. If you die, your doctor can do all that for you, all right? <coughs> and uh, so we have some, it's not great science, but it's the best science we have on side effects. Uh, let me give you some numbers. Um, 2016, 2017, 2018, we averaged 71 various reports of death for flu shots every year. 71 a year. Do you know how many various reports we have of COVID-19 vaccines in 10 months? It's over 16,000. Now remember, it took 28 cases of Guillain Barre syndrome to shut down that program. 16,000 deaths, 10 months, COVID-19 vaccines, that, by the way, is more than all the deaths reported for every vaccine for all 32 years of VAERS. This is your FDA's definition of safe. <clears throat> Does it stop with just dying? No. There's this autoimmune disease called acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, a mild form of just protection spinal cord called acute transverse myelitis. Acute transverse myelitis, all 32 years of the VAERS system, 119 cases, all vaccines combined. How many cases of 10 months of COVID-19 vaccines? It's over 202. 10 months just of COVID-19 vaccines, almost able to double 32 years of cases of ATM and ADEP. FDA's already come out and said, you know what, we're pretty sure it's causing the other gray syndrome more than just getting infected with COVID-19 was. We got this inflammatory upregulation, so we got myocarditis and pericarditis. That's already been demonstrated increased risk. Um, clotting, remember this thing starts clotting? We've already got thrombocytopenic thrombosis, and people dying from that. By the way, of those deaths that we see coming out with COVID-19 associated vaccination, um, two thirds of them occur within the first two weeks. A third of them occur within the first three days. Now, I want you to remember that two weeks thing. Do you know when your CDC considers <coughs> you to be a vaccinated individual? Two weeks after you take your last shot, which means that all of those unfortunate <coughs> things that they check for, those are occurring in unvaccinated individuals. Let that sink in for a minute. Ask yourself, if I was going to do a blood pressure medicine trial, I took half the room and said, you guys are going to get placebo and you guys are going to get the blood pressure medicine. Am I allowed to start counting the side effects of you guys one month later when your blood pressure is down? Or do I have to start counting the promises you get from the day I give you the first pill? Ask me if I can explain that decision on the basis of science. Ladies and gentlemen, I can't come up with it. I can't explain with biology, chemistry, physio physiology, and anatomy. I'm left with money. All right? That'll be the kindest one I can come up with. Um, so, any other stuff we've got that's gone wrong in there? We already talked about uh, that. Uh, talked about ATM. Talked about the, oh, remember I talked about the cytotoxic T cells get reduced? You know what our cytotoxic T cells do? They fight off cases of herpes. Shingles, Epstein Barr virus, herpes could have Epstein and uh, shingles actually cause people to get Bell's palsy. So we've seen a rash of all shingles coming back out, Bell's palsy, and I saw one of my patients forced into this. Had actually a, a shingles episode come on, and she said it was worse than her previous episode of shingles she'd had before. 
Um, this lady who had fatigue after her vaccine. And this is just the ones we've been able to track. Or we can't get people to track heart attack and stroke except for the booster trial where we know it causes more. But my personal opinion, most of those deaths that are occurring in the first three days, they're probably heart attacks and strokes. Now remember, if we took this out and did this in a population of people who made sure they didn't have all those bad diseases until they walked in. So guys, that's uh, pretty much all the data I can tell you about the vaccines. Um, that is not the scariest part of this. The scariest part of this is the story of the non-vaccine options to augment natural immunity. Because remember, we've already shown that natural immunity is better immunity than vaccine immunity. Oh, I should mention one other thing on here. People would say, well, you know, the reason the vaccines are losing of, uh, of efficacy is because Delta is just bad. It's bad. <laughs> Darn immune system doesn't recognize that as being COVID-19 virus. In both the Great Britain data and the Israeli data, do you know what the protection among the people who recover from COVID-19 is? The Delta variant? It's over 99%. So it's not that the immune system doesn't recognize Delta variant. Because the people who recover from Alpha and Beta they're all fine with Delta. Their immune system says, got this, recognize it, got him under control. What does that leave as an explanation for why the immune system losing efficacy? Antibody-dependent enhancement, down-regulation of cytotoxic T cells. You made the immune system work well. All right, that's the only explanation I can come up with, because you can't explain it by the immune system don't recognize Delta. So I gotta tell you guys, if we have some data that says that augmentation of natural immunity protect you from this disease, that sounds a lot better than what we've got for this vaccine if I can prove it, right? You guys buy my premise? Okay, so let's look at some stuff we've got studies on. Uh, back as far as 2008, we had already shown that if you gave somebody zinc when they had the common cold or influenza, that it reduced the duration of symptoms, severity of their symptoms, the duration and severity of their viral shedding. Zinc actually blocks the replication enzymes for most viruses. Very early on in this, we had placebo controlled randomized blinded data on zinc, about 30% effective, reducing symptoms and duration and severity, and viral shedding duration and severity. All right? Zinc works a whole lot better if you use it with hydroxychloroquine or with quercetin. Quercetin is an extract you get from fruits and vegetables. These are all things that make zinc move into cells more easily so they can do their job. Hydroxychloroquine, the trials that you do them in population, um, even without zinc, 30 to 50 percent effective. We even have some studies with hydroxychloroquine to show it prevents death. All right. Um, people say, "Well, I heard hydroxychloroquine doesn't work." So there was a study published in uh, Lancet, one of the three supposedly big journals in medicine, um, that showed hydroxychloroquine used in COVID-19 people uh, didn't have any benefit. It was used without zinc. All right. Um, used a rather unusually high dose. Um, Side effects that came out of hydroxychloroquine in that trial were much greater than they were we've seen in any other trial with hydroxychloroquine. We give people with rheumatoid arthritis all day long, right? Um, and so, based upon that one study, the FDA said, You're not allowed to use hydroxychloroquine for COVID 19. Now, remember, to get your money from the ACO, you have to have an electronic medical record system that reports aggregate data to the federal government. That's right. Every time your doctor writes you a high blood pressure medicine, he has to tell you what he has to tell the government what diagnosis you wrote for, what medicine you used. They know how many diabetics are out taking statin drugs and ACE inhibitors and ARV drugs. They know all of that. They don't know which one's got what, but they know the aggregate data. And they can come out to a hospital and find out that your guy started writing hydroxychloroquine. And you know what? You wrote that for COVID-19. And that's going to affect your reimbursement. And what do you think that does to the hospital administrator of the ACL? What do you think he does to the doctor? goes down there and says, that happens again, you're going to be sitting on the curb, and so with your family. Who do you think wins in a competition with the doctor between you and his family? Do you think doctors would like you? If I came up and said, I'm going to beat you up today, if you don't give me 50 bucks, or if you don't give my family 50 bucks, I'm getting 50 bucks, all right? Because my family's going to starve, you're going to starve, it's two years, you're going to be the guy who's starving, all right? I love my wife, all right? Um, so this is the kind of stuff your government did with hydroxychloroquine. Let me make that worse. Very shortly after that study was published in Lancet, somebody from the Lancet said, you know, these numbers look funny, and they went and got the raw data and retracted the article. 
Now, I got to tell you, until COVID-19, the only time I've ever seen a study get retracted from, a, from a, a journal was when fraud was involved. But after that thing was retracted by the Lancet, did the FDA withdraw its ban on using hydroxychloroquine? No. Didn't withdraw it. As a matter of fact, the CDC actually came out with a statement about four months, three, four months ago now and said, you know what? We're only going to make our decisions on the studies we sponsor. And if we have to change our advice, it'll only because of studies we sponsor. Now, when I was in learning science as an undergrad, but I was told that the rule was the guy who could explain the most data wins, all right? That's science. You weren't allowed to just make back soup where you throw out the data you don't want to explain, you just explain the data you do want to explain. That wasn't science when I was growing up. I still think my biology teacher would have taken me to a great event if I tried to come out with that kind of data. Well, let's look at some other things. How about inhaled steroids? Have you ever trouble breathing? Inhaled steroids? We use them in insulin all the time. They're generic, they're vapor, they're not very expensive at all. God, they all steroids are even cheaper. Data came out and said that if you use these things early on, very effective at shutting down symptoms. After all, I should tell you guys what it is you die from in COVID-19, or influenza for the common cold. Do you die because all the cells fill up with virus and get shed up and, and die? No. You die because those cells that get infected secrete enormous amounts of those inflammatory cytokines and every cell of the lung goes into cell danger response and quits doing its job. Your inflammatory response kills you, not the virus. More of that evidence that maybe it's the immune system that's the problem, all right? So, we got the steroids. We'll take that overabundant inflammatory response of cytokines and lower it down. Show that it actually reduced symptoms, especially if used early in the disease. Uh, let's go to something that works even better. Ivermectin. All right? You've all been told ivermectin is for deworming horses. <coughs> By the way, there's nothing in that horse dewormer that would ever hurt a human. Had people use that horse dewormer, they didn't die. It got better, actually. It's got the exact same use the right amount of the horse dewormer. It's got the same amount of very same chemical. You'll get it. You can go down to CVS and get it, and CVS won't give it to you right now because the federal government punished you. So, ivermectin has studies that show that whether you use it early in the disease or late in the disease, if you have moderate to severe disease, it is between 50 and 85 percent effective at acute treatment. All right? It has statistically significant data in over 30 trials that it not only reduces the degree of your symptoms, the duration of your symptoms, it reduces the degree of your shedding and the duration of your shedding of your fiber, and it reduces death. Placebo-controlled randomized blinded trials of ivermectin that says that. All right. Why all this stuff about ivermectin? Well, it turns out that there have been a couple of meta-analyses done. Meta-analyses means we take a group of studies and put them all together, like we did with that vaccine trial. Uh, if you saw what happened in India with ivermectin, they rolled it out, and it, some of the states didn't do ivermectin, and the disease rate for COVID-19 dropped like a rock in the states that did, and just kept on chugging in the states that did not. About 10 days ago, two weeks ago, on the basis of one of these meta-analyses, India came out and said, well, we think you ought to take ivermectin out of the protocol. We're not sure it works. So I had to go read that meta-analysis. In that meta-analysis, they had 10 studies. Eight of the studies only allowed milder patients into the trial. <coughs> one of the studies looked, used mild and moderate. Only one study even allowed only moderate people into the trial. 85% of the people in the trial were mild disease. And in those trials, ivermectin compared to placebo was no better than placebo. You know what? If I go into the men's locker room and I test birth control pills, I can show you that I do not reduce pregnancy with birth control pills in men. It's no more effective than placebo. Guys, I'm serious, this is logic. And it was based on this kind of stuff that your FDA and CDC said ivermectin should not be used in this disease. All right? But in 30 studies done in moderate and severe patients, all right, this thing has efficacy that's between 50 and 85% efficacious. By the way, one of those studies on ivermectin that was done in mild people was funded by a group that was funded by a group that was funded by your CDC. Uh -huh. Not only did they only let mild people into trial, they measured everybody's liver function test because systemic inflammation will raise your liver function test. In medicine, we say it's gone up three times the upper limit of normal, but that's due to systemic inflammation. And in that trial, if you even had one and a half times the upper limit of normal, you were too inflamed to be mild and were thrown out of the trial. So that's the kind of science your CDC and your FDA funds. 
to the groups that it likes to water its money through that you can't tell that it did. I can tell you that on my phone right now is the recording of a CVS pharmacist admitting to me that it is corporate policy at CVS that they cannot fill an ivermectin prescription for you unless you have worms. And the patient she's telling me this about is a patient that three weeks before she had filled ivermectin for this gentleman. Because in fact, they're using it to treat his post vaccine lung inflammation. And now he can't get ivermectin because he doesn't have worms. And by the way, I've seen the same thing at Kroger and Walgreens, who all have federal contracts, and your federal government can go to them and say, You're going to lose your federal contract unless you do what I want you to do. That's how much control your federal government has over health care right now. I can make this even scarier. Because I can tell you that ivermectin is not the most effective thing we have studied for COVID-19. So what you need to know about vitamin D, it is not a vitamin. It is actually what we call an autopoid pro hormone. What's that? So when you go out in the sunlight and you get, your skin makes vitamin D, which is where you get almost of it, you cannot get vitamin D from food. I can tell you to get the healthy level of vitamin D, you have to drink eight gallons of vitamin D whole milk every day. <laughs> vitamin D is not a vitamin, it's not a coin print hormone, it's mostly made by your skin, you get it through supplements, the liver has to convert it to the active form, which is called 25 hydroxy vitamin D. And interestingly, what this autocoid hormone does is it regulates the maturation and development of immune system cells and it controls the cytokine response from inflamed cells. Those are some other things as well. That's what it does. Very early on, we had a study in June of last year that showed if we acted, this is Mayo Clinic data, all right, said if we took a graph of the death from COVID-19 and graphed it across your 25 hydroxy vitamin D blood level, we saw that as your 25 hydroxy vitamin D level went up from zero, your risk of death from COVID-19 dropped in a near linear fashion until it got to a level of around 40. Then it started to level off. And when your blood level of 25 hydroxy vitamin D got 55, the death rate of uh, COVID-19 leveled off at one quarter the risk of the general population. Now make sure you understand what that probably means. That means that 75% of the chance of dying from COVID-19 is simply because you have a low vitamin D blood level. We already had studies as far back as 2008 showing that we could take people with influenza the common cold spread the same way and cause disease exact same way as COVID-19 virus and that we could give them vitamin D and it was 30 to 70 percent effective at reducing the symptoms, duration, and severity and the duration and severity of viral shedding. In about June of last year we had data said we could do the same thing with vitamin D in humans. Now there's an interesting thing about vitamin D. Remember I said your liver has to convert to the active form 25 hydroxy? Well it turns out when you're really sick and really inflamed this liver stops doing a good job of converting vitamin D to the active form, all right? So there were some studies, paid for by your FDA and CDC, where they took people and gave them dummy pills, severely inflamed people, just admitted to the hospital, dummy pills with vitamin D. Interestingly, they dosed the vitamin D in a way that would make sure the levels didn't go up for four to five days, and then didn't measure blood levels in anybody who died, because you know, if it's possible that you just can't convert at all, you'd actually see more death in those people. You'd be able to prove vitamin D still had an effect. This study came back and said, there's no effect to use vitamin D in this group of people. Now, we had other studies done where you actually dosed it the right way. It said it was one big dose one time. We said, no, we're going to give you 50,000 a day for three straight days, and then 7,000 a day after that. Those studies did show 30 to 50% reduction, symptoms, duration, and severity, um, reduced risk of hospitalization. You know what's really cool? If you had a group of scientists who actually were studying and using everything we knew about this autocoid pro hormone, you'd have had somebody who said, why? If we just took these really sick people and instead of giving them vitamin D, what if we gave them 25 hydroxy vitamin D? Let's just give them the active form that their liver's having trouble making. And you would have thought that would have done like June. That study would have taken one month to do. I'll tell you why I know it took one month to do. Because even though your FDA and CDC didn't do it, there was a hospital in Spain that decided it wouldn't do it. And in one month, they took a group of people already admitted to the hospital. COVID-19 was proven, did not buy a PCR test, didn't buy a good serology test. And 
And these people were already randomized, so they would all get hydroxychloroquine, and they would all get azithromycin. Now that makes it harder for vitamin D, all right? Because if you've got a sinus infection, I've already got you on amoxicillin, and I'm going to take a group of people in the sinusitis who are already amoxicillin, I say, some of you I'm going to give Keflex, and some of you give placebo. It's going to be hard to make Keflex as good if amoxicillin's already good in the day, right? So this group of people, they set 25 hydroxy vitamin D up to fail, all right? 50 people in the active treatment group, 25 to 26 people get placebo, and it's a randomized blinded trial, all right? Everybody knows these kids want to done eye science, all right? Risk of going into the ICU, 13 out of 26 people, 50% of the people on placebo go into the ICU. One guy out of 50 goes into the ICU on 25 hydroxy vitamin D. How about death? Two people out of 26 died in placebo. Zero out of 50 in 25 hydroxy vitamin D. I gotta tell you, ladies and gentlemen, statistically, while that is greater than a 95% chance that that 90% reduction in ICU admission is real, I can't tell you that the reduction in death from 25 hydroxy vitamin D in that study is statistically significant at 95%. I still tell you that it's got better evidence that it reduces death than any vaccine. All right. So I gotta tell you what I did when I read this. Oh, by the way, the other thing they found out in that study, they said, well, let's look at 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Let's see if it works better in obese people versus thin people, or old people versus young people, or people with high blood pressure versus people with normal blood pressure, or people with diabetes versus not diabetes. And you know what? 25 hydroxy vitamin D worked equally well. Whether you're overweight or thin, old or young, high blood pressure or normal blood pressure, diabetes or normal blood sugar. Equally effective in all of us, which means all those risk factors for COVID-19, they're all things that predict your 25 hydroxy vitamin D level. And biochemically, I can tell you how we all do that. All right. So with this data in hand, I gotta tell you, the first thing I did when I read this study, besides asking myself why my CDC and FDA didn't do this study back in March, was to call up my compounding pharmacist and say, hey, dude, look. Got a place that can sell you 25 hydroxy vitamin D. Looks like you can compound up a week's supply of this stuff for like 10 bucks. How fast do you have this made up for my patients? And he said to me, Dan, I can't do that for you because we've already gotten a reminder from the FDA that if we compound up 25 hydroxy vitamin D, we get a $50,000 fine and lose our license. Now, ladies and gentlemen, between that and what we're doing with ivermectin, hydroxychloric, and the 25 hydroxy vitamin D, how is this any different than gas emissions? Do you know right now the price of ivermectin at your local CVS has gone through the roof? You can get it more cheaply at a compounding pharmacist if you can find any physician who would be willing to write it for you. But when it comes down between his family and you, I can guarantee you're not going to get it. I have to turn away panic people all day long from my voicemails and emails begging me for uh, for. Uh, for a prescription for ivermectin. 25 hydroxy vitamin D, by the way, is now available. Um, you can buy it online. It's a product called D.develop. That's D period D E L O P. I can't give you medical advice. That's my legal but I think one of the medical boards will have to give you that disclaimer. You're not getting medical advice. Anything you hear here from through your individual physician. But if the patient would come into my office and say to me, Gee, Dr. Stock, I have COVID-19 and I don't been taking vitamin D regularly. What do you think I should do? I think I would probably tell him to take about 55 to 60 of those capsules of D-Fellow all at one time. And two days later, I would tell him to take half that dose. And three days after that, I'd tell him to take another half of that dose. And then take half of that dose every week thereafter, because that's the way it was done in the study. That came out of Spain. Um, the other thing you need to know about all these treatments that help you with your immunity the sooner you use them in the disease, the better they work. I can tell you inflammation, when it goes out of control and all the cells have gone in the cell name response, it's real hard to get them back out of there again. So the sooner you start this stuff off, the better it works. What was the advice that your CDC came out and gave the entire population of the United States? It was go home, and when you're ready for the ventilator, come back and we'll put a tube down <coughs> You were told to stay away from your poor doctor so you wouldn't give him that nasty infection as if I didn't have a note that said I was supposed to take my chances on that. And you were told to go home and die. And if you try and get your hands on horse paste, we'll make fun of you. And we'll shut off to the pharmacy when you're possibly getting this stuff. And how is this any different than throwing Jews in the North Sea to see how fast they'll freeze?
next step, which is what Dr. Mengele was doing the experiments on. And now, ladies and gentlemen, you explain to me why I should look at my federal government and think that it's any different than a Nazi group that is running a government. Right? <laughs>
class two misdemeanor. And your state board of health has the right to come to your school, and if it thinks there's too many cases of COVID-19, shut it down and send all the kids home. That is the power that our state legislature has granted the executive branch right now. And they can take that away. And I believe Senator Collins is here because he wants you all to call your state representative and your state senators and let them know that you want that legislation and that you don't want it to happen in January, they're meeting in the middle of November. And so they can actually, they are not going to have to call a special session. The regular session is never ended. Therefore, they can choose to address this building, this uh, issue in the middle of November. And I hope you will both call Senator Bray, who is the uh, President Pro Tem of the Senate, and call Speaker of uh, Houston, who is the Speaker of the House of Representatives, and let them know that this is not a back burner issue that can be addressed later on. Once we have it so our nurses and doctors and nurse practitioners and everybody who works at Raytheon and any other business doesn't have to make this choice with a financial gun to their head, and guys, I'll even tell you, I don't want the vaccines to go off the market. You want to take one of these things, go take it, all right? You're not going to hurt me. I already have a symptomatic conversion, asymptomatic conversion. I just tested positive one day while donating blood, never had any symptoms from the infection whatsoever, all right? Um, I didn't even get into the protection you can get if you had selenium and iodine and get your iron levels checked to what we already know in there. I can tell you those things taken care of, pretty much you're going to have an asymptomatic zero conversion. Um, Long-term solutions. You know, ladies and gentlemen, one of the problems we have right now is there's probably only 20 people in the federal government who really wield any power. Nine of them you can never rebuke. That's the Supreme Court. One of them you get a rebuke every four years. Probably of the remaining uh, 15, you get a rebuke some of them about every six years, and the others you get a rebuke every two years through an electoral process which is highly controlled by lobbyists. How are elections working for you guys? Yeah. Other than you guys see the guys at the federal government get smarter because you vote so good? It seems to be working for you guys? No. <laughs> so I want to give you a little story about the Convention of States Organization. And let me tell you a little bit of the natural of the history of the United States. Um, after the 13 colonies got their independence from Britain, there were actually 10 years where they formed another country called the Confederate States of America. That had a very weak central government, couldn't raise taxes, couldn't even make the states behave and obey any of the laws it passed. And, but they did that very weak central government because the 13 colonies were terrified of the tyranny that would develop if they made a strong central government. So they just got through with a strong central government in England. It's pretty tyrannical, right? But after 10 years of total dysfunction, they met for the Constitutional Convention of 1787 that went on for months. And the reason it went on for months is they were debating everything they were doing because they were scared of the monster they were building. But after months and months of debate and arguing everything they possibly do, they came down with this thing pretty well designed. And they had Article 5, which is the part of the Constitution that talks about how the Constitution would be amended. And they had it set up so that Congress would propose an amendment by two thirds vote of both houses. And then three quarters of the states had to ratify those proposed amendments before they became law. And you will notice they would not let the federal government amend itself, right? But on that very last day of the Constitutional Convention, Colonel George Mason stood up and he said, ladies and gentlemen, I think you've overlooked this. We're all sure this federal government is going to become corrupt at some point in time. We don't know how it's going to become corrupt. But when it does, the only way to propose the solutions to their corruption is if they propose the solution. Anybody here really think they're going to do that? <laughs> and so he proposed that another clause be added to Article 5 that said that two thirds of the state legislatures passed a resolution calling for a convention to propose amendments. They could send their delegates. That convention had to be called. They could propose whatever amendments on the topic that they selected for they wanted to. The states could ratify those amendments by three quarters vote. And the federal government could be amended, its powers taken away and restrained, and things changed. There was nothing the federal government could do about it. Amen. And I got to tell you, in all the months of the Constitutional Convention, there was only one proposal that was unanimously approved without debate. And that was Colonel George Mason's proposal. The whole room, we had four different people taking notes. They all looked around the room and said, the room looked around each other and said, oh, yeah, we got to do that. So right now, there have already been 15 states that have passed a resolution calling for a convention to propose amendments to reduce the power of the federal government. They can only reduce it. They cannot propose amendments that would increase. Uh, amendments to force it into fiscal restraint. For those of you who don't know, your federal government is $31 trillion in debt. And proposals to limit the terms of service in the federal government. Yeah. 15 states have already passed it because of the good graces of people like Senator Cohn. Indiana is one of those states. Yeah. Yeah. Nevertheless, I will beg you to go to conventionofstates.com and consider signing the petition there. Because if you sign that petition two 
good things happen. First of all, we throw all the states that have inside it to show how popular this thing is. All right? Second of all, if you sign that and give us permission to send you email and texts, we can notify you if legislation comes up, say like legislation to ban vaccine discrimination, all right? And let you know that that legislation is up and to call your senators and representatives and support that. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't like lobbying going on, I can tell you that because the Supreme Court has ruled that lobbying is freedom of speech, the only way that can be changed is through a constitutional amendment. Does anybody think Washington, D.C. is going to pass, is going to propose an amendment to ban lobbying? <laughs> I don't think so either. So the short-term solution, ladies and gentlemen, is we get through our state legislature and ask them to pass laws to protect us. And the long-term solution, in my opinion, is the Convention of States. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been very, very kind to listen to me travel on all this time. I am happy to take any questions you have if you have any subject you want to have. That lady had her arm up first. One percent. The question was, does VAERS only report, does only one percent of adverse events get reported on VAERS? And that is a correct statement. What we've seen from previous vaccines is only one percent get reported. That means that 16,000 people have died. It's probably much, much more than that. All right? This gentleman had a hand up. single study I quoted you today is on the website www.purehealthmed. That somebody, probably a lobbyist, got the expertometer and went to a group of doctors and plugged it into it and it read real high. So they said, okay, he's an expert. And they formed a panel of Medicare and Medicaid people who came and said, yeah, we're going to do this. And so that's how it's done. Um, all of this is not voted on by Congress. They don't like to vote on controversial stuff. They actually do this by giving the power of the executive branch to come up with regulations, and this is what Mr. Obama pointed. That's right. There's not a current white law. That's right. There's no voting on it by you and me. You're allowed to have a two-week comment period. If you even knew that we were going to discuss the thing, you'd be able to comment on it. And that's how it goes. It goes in the background. By the way, so you know how well this program works. You guys know why you have an opioid epidemic? That same group decided that pain was a vital sign. And so in all those electronic medical records, they said, you have to put in there and ask if the person has pain. You know, you go to your doctor, I'm you, do you have pain today? The reason he's asking that is he don't get paid if he doesn't ask. And then he said, if you ask and there's pain, you have to treat it. If you don't treat it, you don't get paid. You know what, the quickest, easiest thing in a doctor who has to get people in and out real quick, because by the way, they pay doctors three times better if they see 10 people for six minutes than if they see one patient for an hour. That's right. The reason you're ever getting time with your doctor is he's not profitable to the ACO if he actually spends any time with him. All right? And so these doctors being rushed and knowing that, hey, the ACO won't get paid, I'm going to get fired, my family's out on the curb, decided to give everybody opiates was a good idea. By regulations passed by the executive branch. Dr. Scott, can we take a couple more questions? And, uh, I want to make a couple announcements. Sure. <coughs> Go ahead, sir. Along the lines of the deworming idea, there's a video going around about Joe Tippett, who taking a binbins it all, and it uh, raises, I'm not that knowledgeable about, but P53, or is it T53? Uh, somehow it, it, it doesn't allow the, the cancer to feed through its tubules. Uh, do you know anything about that? The name of the chemical you said was what? Uh, fin bin I know about it. fin bin Yeah. I thought I had cancer. In fact, I had my husband on it for a while as well. <laughs> um, I actually don't know anything about that chemical, but what I can tell you is we have a placebo controlled randomized blinded trial on vitamin D that shows it reduces the risk of developing new cancer by 80%. Wow, that sounds awesome. By the way, your, your federal government paid for a study called the Vital Trial. Jury rigged to survive the D wouldn't work, and it still worked for the black people. And did you hear your NIH come out and say, oh, black people, vitamin D's been shown statistically to reduce the risk of cancer? Did they come out and say that they all? No. Their statement was, need more research. Go ahead, sir. Dr. Dr. Scott, uh, the 
two and a half years of this propaganda, which it really started eight to ten years ago. This is not new. This was playing. That's not a conspiracy theory. There's plenty of facts to show that. But what's so strange out of the hundreds of people that I've contacted that have taken the vaccine, they don't even know what's in the vaccine. I'd like to, I would be very grateful if you could present on the booster and vaccine the ingredients called graphene oxide, prions, and how that affects your immune system after taking the vaccine because the pharmaceutical companies give it, uh, but they don't go into detail. And I know you'd like to do the study, so do I, uh, because the television has never told you. They just tell you to take it, but they never tell you what's in it. So I don't know a great deal about graphene oxide other than its chemical structure. I don't know its toxicity and what its toxicity levels are. I got to tell you, I think the most toxic thing that's in the vaccines is the mRNA in the beginning. Right? Uh, we do know, by the way, that that mRNA is being inserted into genes. 20 out of 23 chromosomes are shown to have that MRI, meaning you have spike protein gene now in you forever. Whether that would be expressed or not, we don't know, but we know it's in there. Um, as to all the other chemicals that are in there, how toxic they are, we don't have as good a research that I have seen as I'd like to see. A lot has been postulated to be bad about them. I don't want to stoke more fear without good research to explain this. Especially since I already believe that the most toxic thing in the vaccine is the vaccine. <laughs> we actually are giving you something to have you make a toxic chemical. Why that makes sense, I can't figure out. But I don't, you know, there, what else is in there, I don't know. My bet is it's probably trace levels of things that aren't bad enough. The prion thing, there probably are not prions in the thing. Prion is a protein, but we do have concerns that the spike protein can lead to a prion-causing protein. Uh, we don't know that it does that. It's a concern we have. We do know that some of the proteins that you make to regulate inflammation can themselves make prions. That is actually part of what causes people to have a, a, a alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency disease. All right? uh, we also know that's what the amyloid going on in people with Alzheimer's have. And so we are concerned by causing a chronic inflammatory state, we may make somebody start to get a prion-like disease from this. These are all things we don't have great studies on because, of course, we didn't do good studies on any of these vaccines. And I'm going to tell people, guys, I don't think we need to wander into that line, that landmine field. We have enough data that these daggone things are more risk than they are benefit. And we don't need to even bring up these other things. We've got the data that says the Teflon stuff in the vaccine is what's harmful. You get shut me off when you need me to what, shut me off. I, I, I know there's a lot of questions here tonight, and uh, I, I know that uh, there's a, probably a lot of questions people like to ask. I just want to mention before everybody leaves here, uh, again, uh, if you have enjoyed this presentation tonight, and if you want to leave some contributions here that we can uh, help Dr. Stock in what he's doing, and also, again, the, the church here, Pastor Russ being so kind to let us have this facility tonight. I, I, we would appreciate, and I know they would, any contributions to help this cause. And uh, on the note, I want to mention about when you was talking about the legislature. You're absolutely right. And I have a couple of bills. One is addressing the school boards that's out of control. In fact, I had a conversation with Senator Bray this, this afternoon, Rob Bray. Uh, about hope, hoping that he would give that bill a hearing. He wanted to see the language, so I had my staff send it to him today. I had talked to him since we've done that. I also have a bill about this mandatory vaccine, uh, wear a mask, get the vaccine, uh, passports. I've got a bill that would outlaw and prohibit that sort of thing here in the state of India, too. I'm hoping that. <laughs> citizens to make calls in to try to influence our, our leadership to grant those bills a, a committee hearing and, and hopefully we can get it on the floor for our votes. But uh, it is going to be the legislature and I, I, I got to tell you, uh, with this new administration, I'm convinced that the only protection that citizens in this country have is the state legislature. That's all the same between them and this renegade you know, uh, administration we're now dealing with. Locals don't have the power to do it. States barely do, but we do have some ability to block it. So anyway, I just want to mention that. And uh, is that for me? Okay. In this uh, the email to the legislature, once you give it exactly what it's supposed to be said and to who, well, everybody on the email list here that got here because of your notice, yeah. you make sure that information gets out so we send the right. Right. All well, right person, et cetera. Well, you know, if it
go to Indiana's General Assembly's website, you can find the, all of the legislators. You can find leadership's names, and you find phone numbers and email addresses to, uh, to reach them. But you need to do that. We all need to do that. But uh, anyway, I, I know it, it is getting late, and I, I, I know we've, uh, I'm not sure the church, they're okay. But uh, I just want to get that, uh, I guess, a uh, little commercial out there to help us on that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stock, and also uh, the church for letting us have this facility. And also, you know, our military, we've got, we've got a son that works at Raytheon, a captain in the Army Reserve. And he was forced to make the decision, which he was just agonized about for the past several months. And, uh, and he's had to get his first shot. It was either that he had to think of his family. And our daughter, who is an agent for the Justice Department, now is looking to lose her job. Both of them, you know, he was within three years of his of his retirement. That's what he was faced with. Our daughter's facing with the same thing as an agent for the <coughs> Justice Department. It's amazing that people who want to work, who show up every day, who dedicate their life to achieve a goal in a profession, are top-notch American citizens, proper citizens, they're the target. The people who stay home and don't want to work, don't want to hit a lick, they're the ones getting the money. And then we got all the flood of people coming in from all over the world that's coming through, not being vaccinated, not being checked, being distributed across the nation, right? And then who do they go after? The good, upstanding Americans. I just want to put that shot in there because. Uh, what you was talking about when you said Raytheon, I mean, like our son, he had the double whammy, military, and of all, this goofball Secretary of Defense, Austin, who's got the IQ of a bar of soap, <laughs> is a board member of Raytheon. So not only is it dictated that the military get it, but as a board member of Raytheon has also. So there's nowhere to run to. That's right. We well, are. Why can't we do any of this bill work now and wait till November? Well, the, the bill making process right now, you have to have LSA to write the bill. And I'm just, I'm just waiting to get drafts back on these bills. They won't be able to file a bill until uh, probably about the early part of November, mid-November. Uh, so that's the process already. Like we are still in session because we, we recess. But there's a formality on how that cycle works. So then another question. So I know we have this bill, I think, what is SB 74, I think it's called, but it, that someone, I know that you like co-authored it and with like eight other people. So that was tied into, I think it went to some kind of like Department of Labor. Yeah, it did. Uh, it that committee. Leadership, as Dr. Stock said, Senator Pro Tim Rod Gray, and, uh, and Senator <laughs> Representative Houston in the House. Should have he's the Speaker of the House. And your own particular legislators, too, by the way, House and Senate guys, to help encourage them to support these bills as they're coming up. And I'm sure there's other bills, other legislators working on a similar bill. I don't know. But I just want my bills, I want my bills ironclad tight. I want all the rivets in them, so nobody can dance around it like these school boards do that. So, uh, just a child for that. I have one question. When are you going to run for government? <laughs> Children, when the parents and grandparents and everybody's hugging them, loving on them, 
especially the young girls. The first thing you need to know is that when you're vaccinated, that spike protein does not shed from you to anybody else in any way that would hurt them unless you're a mother who is breastfeeding. All right, we do have cases of breastfeeding mothers got vaccinated, kid got clots and died. But I don't want people to shun the vaccinated. Most of these people had no idea what they were getting. Yes, they shed more virus than the rest of us do, all right? But guys, we're all gonna have to get an immune system that takes care of this virus, or we're all gonna die, all right? So there's no reason to shun these people. And I don't want anybody to hear this and come out of here and some of these fact are saying, Dan wants to be vaccinated, she's gonna shun them. I don't, they're not a danger for us. We're all gonna face this virus, all right? And by the same token though, there is no reason to not to let your grandchildren come over to your house because you're not vaccinated, all right? You're gonna shed less than a vaccinated person does, at least less. By the way, there was a study that suggested vaccinated people shed 250 times as much virus as people who are naturally infected uh, from Thailand. So the important thing to understand about this is none of this virus avoidance, viral avoidance, has no rational basis for a viral respiratory pathogen spread by aerosols in the animal reservoir. This is the reason we don't do it for influenza and the common cold is because it doesn't make a difference. Vaccination doesn't change that reality in any way. When Dr. Fauci says if we just vaccinate, we'll get rid of this virus, do you know how hard it is to keep a mask on a moose? <laughs> do you know how hard it is to chase a bear down and vaccinate him? Do you want that job? This virus is not going away, ladies and gentlemen. You're either going to get an immune system that survives or you don't. And there's no rationale for any other statement on the issue. Dr. Fauci is still saying that you were hoping that we're going to get to that final stage where you eradicate the virus. This is a bald-faced lie. There is no way to get rid of the virus. From the day it crawled out of that lab, you were going to get an immune system right. that takes care of it or you're going to or, or you're going to die. That's all there is to it. You can't escape it. I'll take one more, and then my wife's going to come yell at me. So, <laughs> in, in her defense, I have another lecture to do tomorrow in the Indianapolis area. So, but, uh, okay. So I can take two more. Okay. So I'm going to take this one in yours because Liz was so sick. What would you do with a patient that is on a bed? Like if uh, the patient or the families don't think they're getting the proper care, what would you suggest to them to do? So let me first I'll make a disclaimer that I don't do intensive care unit, so I'm not really good at this. So I'm just going to take you my best guess for the literature. Um, if you're in a hospital where well, they will not exceed the family's demands, um, I would probably grab an AMBU bag and take your parent out of the day on hospital and go down to Tractor Supply Corporation and get some ivermectin. <laughs> There have been several lawsuits for yeah. hospitals to exceed the family's demands, and I hope you'll consider doing that. I would load that person with vitamin D, or more importantly, get that stuff called D developed, the 25 hydroxy vitamin D, get it as fast as you can. I advise people for acute loading and zinc to take 50 milligrams twice a day. Uh, I recommend for, that they also be combined with selenium, uh, uh, 200 to 400 milligrams a day as an acute loading. Uh, and, Frankly, vitamin C, 1,000 milligrams of liposomal vitamin C, three to four times a day. There's no one drug for COVID-19. You throw the book at it, as inflammation gets out of control, you've got to pound it down. The sooner you pound it down, the better it works. So you go to town with them so you get things taken care of for them. And then I also tell people, if you're getting sick, they say, gee, am I going to the hospital? My answer is, don't go to the hospital until you can get a doctor right through high flow oxygen. If high flow oxygen will make it so that you can talk and you can think, I don't care if your oxygen saturation is 80%, the ventilator will probably not make you better. It just increases lung scarring. Don't go to the hospital. Once you're in there, you can't get the stuff you need. They won't give it to you. Except for monoclonal antibodies, we do have some decent data on monoclonal antibodies. This is a useful thing to use. It's a very expensive thing to use. It doesn't look like it works as well as a 25 hydroxy vitamin D and ivermectin does, but it's worth having that. Go ahead, ma'am. I was wondering about black seed oil and then also monoclonal antibodies. So, black seed oil, I don't know of any research. And I got to tell Black seed oil. Oh, black seed which oil. Is, which is, which is my understanding, which is <coughs> chlorophyll. 
Um, many of these essential oils actually interfere with inflammatory cytokine signaling. And if you've got a boatload of inflammatory cytokines, anything you can do to shut that down to a human level, I'm on board with. I don't know any data on black seed oil, so I don't want to tell anybody that I know it works or I know it doesn't. Um, I can't think of any reason why it would hurt. And, uh, you know, honestly, when people tell you that getting ivermectin from horse paste is dangerous too, it's like, look, it's getting ready to die. Horse paste ain't so bad. Black seed oil is probably the same category. <laughs> on monoclonal antibodies, um, I don't want to say that I've read a great deal on monoclonal antibodies. They appear to work much better if they're started before you go to the hospital, where they don't appear to work very well. I do have one concern about monoclonal antibodies, and this is more of an experimental, experiential, and theoretical concern than it's proven. Most of the research we had done with monoclonal antibodies was before the development of the Delta variant. Remember, Delta variant is much easier to be enhanced. So the question is, do these monoclonal antibodies, which for those who don't know what they are, monoclonal antibodies are man-made antibodies that just happen to bind the COVID-19 virus. If you ask me, do we know that they don't uh, enhance Delta variant? The answer is we don't know. I have had two people that were getting better on ivermectin and got talked into monoclonal antibodies and regressed and got worse again. Now, whether that was because they had a transfusion reaction because they weren't pre-medicated or because they had enhancement of the monoclonal antibodies, I can't answer that. I guess my best guess is if you're circling the drain, you know, all hands on deck, do whatever you can. Um, they're probably more benefit than they are harm in that situation. Ladies and gentlemen, I have to go because we have a three-hour drive home.